I like that little that little room you're in. I can't work out whether it's an airing cupboard or a bathroom. Or is well, it just no, like it's, a... it's just um, just a box room, like a spare room. Like like Harry Potter under the stairs. I've never seen Harry Potter. Um, you're a parent, aren't you? Not really. How how have you got away with not watching Harry Potter? I guess by not raising a kid. <laughs> um, surely you know children, though. Um, I've got a nephew that I remember him being into the books, but I don't go to the cinema, um, so I was never never asked to accompany him when he was um, when he was a kid to go and see Harry Potter movies. Um, so I've managed to avoid it. I thought we were, I, I, there was a moment there where I was thinking, God, we, we, this is starting quite heavy, isn't it? Like, I, I was going to say, like, what, do you not talking know? about Harry Potter? Well, no, more sort of like there was a, when I said then, like, you know, like, <laughs> it, it, it was, there was almost when I was talking about children, there was, there was almost part of me that almost went, do you not, you know, did you, did you not want children? And I was thinking, that's that's very familiar for someone that you've. No, just... I fathered a child. I just don't know her. That's That's the short answer. See, this is—I mean, this is heavy now, though, isn't it? Um, I guess it's—that's about all I can say on it, as I don't know her. So, yeah. Okay, that <laughs> I'm going to have a little vibe shift. Diddle, right. diddle, diddle. Um, it's dead good to speak to you, Miles. I've, it's uh, very nice to be asked, mate. Loved your songs for forever and ever and ever. I was having a bit of a—I was having a bit of a wonder stuff binge this morning, and I—I uh, I was I had this like repressed memory of skidding on my knees to dizzy at a school disco <laughs> <laughs> i was feeling uh i was feeling frisky listening to it thinking about i wonder when the tuck shop opens so um yeah no it's a real buzz um i thought we'd start with where you're at at the moment um you had a record that came out was it october something like that yeah i think it was october um yeah you rattle through your solo records um i'll, f I'll finish doing that now oh why is that I've just finished making records. There's, there's very little point in doing it. If I want to write a new song, I'll write a new song, but I just can't be asked to go to all the trouble of rounding up a lot of musicians, coughing up a lot of money to um, record, invest in 18 months or thereabouts in a record uh, for them not to really sell anymore. <laughs> well, it's funny. Okay, so it's funny you say this because I feel like this has definitely become a theme in the last couple of episodes I've done where I've said to people, are oh, you going to make another record? Because that's part of the narrative of what musicians mm -hmm. do. And and everyone's saying, nah, I can't really be, can't really be bothered anymore. Yeah. Um, and they're all saying the same thing as you. I mean, does that does that change? Or is that do you think that's just the economics now? Well, I th the, the change has been, I mean, it's, everything's in a state of flux, isn't it? And, and I think once, when I remember, I remember iTunes store coming along and being mildly interested. So it's so much so as to getting an account and downloading a couple of records, you know, paying for them. And this was around the same time that I met my friend Indian who signed me to his independent label in, uh, Point Pleasant in New Jersey in the US and he hated the whole idea of the iTunes store because you ran a label and my initial excitement of being able to sit at home and go oh wow because I live in the middle of nowhere it's like a three hour journey back then it was to go up to a find a record shop go into town and which I used to enjoy doing. In fact, I remember the day that Stanley Road came out by Paul Weller and I lived here and uh, I hadn't got a car, so I had to walk six miles over a small mountain, get a train, go into Shrewsbury, get the train back, and then walk the other six mile back. And to me, that was like not only the financial investment of going up to whatever it was in Shrewsbury, then maybe a Virgin Records and getting it, but the investment of spending pretty much the entire day um, the investment of my time and and then feeling like I really owe this record my time um, because it didn't initially blow me away mm. in the case of that record. But it's a record I came to love because I put the time in it in, in, in exactly the same way that I used to when I was a little kid and money was scarce. So you had to really carefully choose what record you were going to get each Saturday. 
and then you'd put the time in with it. Uh, two great examples are Joy Division and Echo and the Bunny Men's first album. I just didn't get them straight away, but yeah, I'd gone yeah. uptown and I'd spent my day investing my time. So I spent the time with the records, and now those records are lifelong loves of mine. Mm. Um, we don't do that anymore. Um, or it's easy not to do that. And yeah. I miss that. And, you know, when somebody will send me a link, whether it's to Bandcamp, YouTube or whatever, I sort of make my decision. And, and I know I'm wrong. You know, I'll listen to the first 30 seconds of a track somebody's put their time into, but I've just put in 30 seconds into it. Yeah, yeah it's not for me, which is yeah. the way I feel about most music. So going back to what Indian was talking about, the guy that ran gig records in New Jersey, was, you know, Steve Jobs coming in here and basically it's destroying tons of jobs for a start. So manufacturing goes, artwork doesn't matter anymore. Uh, distribution goes, shops will be destroyed. Those old meccas that you would spend your Saturday afternoons in. And I'm like, holy shit, I hadn't thought of any of it like that. Yeah, so yeah. once that started, it's just been a steady decline really in how we – uh, get in touch with and consume our music and and it constantly gets worse and never seems to get better without uh that is with the exception of little chinks of like of go i definitely want this on vinyl so i'll go and walk to three or four uh record shops in shrewsbury i don't go anywhere else um and if i can't pick whatever it is that's that i'm interested in then i'll order it you know hopefully from a link from the artist website and that's exciting and then usually a month goes by i've forgotten i've ordered it and then when it turns up it's like yay you know and then i'll put a bit of time into it um but yeah it, it people we can up we're i did well i'm certainly going to say i'm guilty of it we being able to stream things or, or just you know have a look at have a listen to something online you make that instant decision and i'm not going to spend a month with it getting to know the record i do I think- try to but I think I, th- I, th- I think it's a thing of like I, I've said this on the podcast loads of times. I think that for me, it's like we never really stopped to. I mean, I did because I'm like a sage and I'm aware of these things before they happen. But the thing that I don't think people really stop to think about how like this stuff was going to change the culture, you know? Mm-hmm. Because for me, like you know music is often supposed to be challenging and abrasive and nasty and ugly and a lot of the music I like is and right. I think the thing with streaming or the thing with digital platforms is that like or almost that kind of try before you buy kind of nature mm-hmm. of where we're at is that it's just too easy to bail out and I yeah. think that you need that investment of cash to try to like something which is almost like what you're saying with that bunny man and the and the joy division record really i guess that like you know two men of an age i'm i'm in you know i'm in my 40s and you're in your 30s right exactly and, yeah um it would be really easy to be like oh they've they've i don't know who they are have <laughs> literally systematically destroyed everything that was brilliant about the best thing ever which in my view is music yeah but can you find any positives in there I, I mean, I can conf- today. Uh, Steve Albini um, did a nice little post about Dead Meadow, who have been going for over twenty years that I've never heard of. About a four-minute guitar solo on the final track of their latest album, and the, the way he wrote it, I'm like, I have to find this immediately. Right, uh, and he's quite right. It's genius, and I've played the album about six times. Streamed the album about six times today. Uh, and put an order in for the vinyl so and that's not that unusual i'd say once a month that will happen to me it, but I, I usually have to be led by the nose by someone albini i trust if he's going to say something's good it's so a good uh I, I listen to tons of jazz these days so um I start. I started maybe six seven years ago of starting to mainly just listen to instr- instrumental jazz um because it it puts a really lovely atmosphere in my house because it reminds me of my parents' house when I was a kid because my dad's a huge jazz fan. So there was always somebody blowing a saxophone coming out of his fantastic stereo in the lounge. Right, right. And um and I don't I don't know what the maybe I was I don't know, maybe I heard Coltrane in a 
movie or something like i've got to start buying some of this stuff so i've got quite a decent uh jazz vinyl collection now and i try um as hard as i can to find contemporary um jazz artists so there's a guy called zoza cole who happens to be from birmingham um who i've been to see live that was the first gig i went to see live once the lockdowns were over uh just received his <clears throat> second album on a cd last week got the vinyl order in we'll be waiting for that so i do find things and i suppose the try before you buy nature of streaming is good in that way because i i i'm probably saying it's the wrong guy but i i've never really enjoyed listening to radio I don't really, you know, I, I grew up with John Peel, who basically just gave you the bare bones information and didn't really try to push any. He didn't think he was a comedian. He wasn't trying to push it, put a personality on us. He would read out addresses of seven yeah. inch singles. Yeah. And that's all I want from a DJ. You know, I can't listen to things like six music. I, I don't care about your personality. I don't care about, you. you know, your, your, your in jokes with your mates, that sort of style of, Chris Evans, four people standing around a microphone cracking in jokes. I just find insufferable and, and, and always have, you know. Yeah. So I do need people to something I can read <clears throat> that goes, you should really listen to this. Or I think this is amazing because, and then I will go and find it. So, yeah, I don't listen to radio. So try before you buy. Nature of streaming is good as long as you do the buying. and uh, And I think a lot of people forget to do that. You know, where, where this conversation started, he's like, I'm not going to make any more records because they don't sell. I mean, I, I I can look at, say, sales of my um, solo records from 10 years ago or sales of a new Wonder Stuff record from 12 years ago. And the sales are good. You know, we know exactly how many to to press. And um, we're even from ten, even from a decade ago, since sort of Spotify has taken over, which I don't put new records on my new records on there. Um, you know, we're at half what we were selling physically, which you you which means now you can't make the money back that you spent in the studio when you know paying for a good producer, um, paying the musicians. Of course, you you can't make that money back at my level anyway. I mean, is is the Spotify thing? Is, is is that you like making what statement you can make? Um, I, I'm not saying that to simply make a statement. It's a it, it's a sentence of truth, really. You know, it, it it is. And again, you know, I was a fool when Spotify came along. When somebody first showed me that in a dressing room at Shepherd's Bush Empire, I'm like, really? And I had a friend that wanted to start something. Um, he's, um an agent at William Morris. He's my old agent in the states. And he was talking to me in the mid nineties about this thing. He says, think blockbuster, but I'm going to call it like the world jukebox. And it will be, you know, a hard drive somewhere in California. That's got every recorded piece of audio ever on right. it from speeches to bird yeah. song to every piece of music. And you'll join it like blockbuster. And this is, so this is before iTunes as well, the iTunes store. And I, all th I thought that all sounded very interesting. So when I was first introduced to Spotify years ago, I'm like, Oh, this is that thing that Mark was telling me he was going to do. Looks like somebody beat him to it. Um, and then it was kind of cool being in a dressing room and somebody going, oh, see if it's got, I don't know, a, a B-side by the Buzzcocks. I'd like to hear that right now. Sure, it had. And that was an interesting evening. And and then the, I start asking people in the music business, like, so when, when my stuff turns up in here, what am I getting paid? And well, well, nothing. <laughs> yeah. So, and then that's when you start to go, oh, this is wrong, isn't it? Because, okay, I've had my fun. I've been doing this professionally for 36 years. So I, I just feel so bad for, you know, a little tale I tell on stage while I'm doing acoustic shows at the minute is when, when we put Unbearable out, our second single, which is on our own label, probably pressed up anywhere between five and 6,000 copies, 12 inches and seven inches. And within six weeks, we bought a van, you know, off the off the profit of those records, mm -hmm. and and that allowed us to get out and play to more people, being more self sufficient, and um, and that was the way it used to go. And getting a million streams, if you're a new band, a million streams on Spotify, Spotify or YouTube ain't going to get your dick. 
Yeah, you know, that's, so not, they, that's not going to help your cause at all. Um, this is definitely the first time the phrase, it's not going to get you dick, has been used on this podcast. Thank you for uh, <laughs> adding that to the conversation. You're welcome. I feel a bit like with Spotify, it's just one of those things where it, it, it just should... There was no consent involved in it. Like, no, that's, that's, the, that's the thing that's mad for me. It's almost like... I remember watching a... Um, it's not not quite related to Spotify, um, but definitely sort of the, the, the change in shape of how music was given to us and, and um, it, it's relatable in that way. But I remember watching this, this footage of Pete Waterman, mm. you know, not, not a man that I looked to for, uh, to be like the soul of the, the record business, but he was like ranting and raving about just what was happening. And I remember at the time sort of being like, oh, chill out, chill out, Pete, you know, you silly man. But mm. with hindsight, I look back and I'm like, now, nah, man, he was on it. It's, he spotted it. Yeah, it, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And then he retreated and made his train sets. You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, the way I understand that it happened was you had things like um, LimeWire comes to mind. The, the big one before that that Lars Ulrich went after. Um, the... Yeah. So there were these sites where they were illegal. There was anyone could put tracks up, and any of us could go and grab them. And there were so many of them that the record companies were just playing whack-a-mole with, with their lawyers. Every time they'd shut one down, another what, 10 more would appear. And they were getting pretty sick of it and spending a lot of money on it. But what Spotify did was said, this won't be uh, an illegal file sharing thing. It We've grabbed all your stuff that you own uh, illegally and uh, when we go live, we offer you, as in the record companies and the publishers, this is what we offer you. We're going to do this. And and they basically got the music industry at a time that it was tired and it was running out of money, shutting down all the illegal filing, file sharing. And the labels let Spotify dictate what they were going to pay, which now, so the labels are fine as long as they've got quantity. Uh, but they sold every single artist that they signed out. They, they signed us, you know, sold us all out because, you know, we, we get, well, it's nothing, you know, it is nothing. It's not even worth talking about the, the point zero zero whatever. Um, and that's the annoying bit. It's, it's the people that I signed my music over to. So I'm thinking it's universal for me. You sold me out. You didn't have to do this. You could have fought for, for better royalty breaks for the artist. See, I see. I know people who I I always say this when we get into this chat. There's an episode uh, of the podcast with Tom Gray, who um, who's involved in the broken record campaign. Tom Gray who was in Gomez and mm -hmm. was is, and he um yeah he kind of breaks down the economics of it all. And I I mean it absolutely like horrified me when when he did so. I do know I do know some people in the industry that talk about how actually the problem isn't streaming per se but it's actually the ambiguity between between basically what the labels cut is mm. I, it, it's like the it's that lack of transparency so actually mm. there is a way that streaming can work but it just means that the labels need to take a much smaller share sure but also it is that thing i, I guess the counterbalance to that is that spotify you know when you break it down it's a tech company in the sense that it, it's almost like it's not trying to build a sustainable business, is it? It's just trying to create its brand, which then can be sold on. Is how mm -hmm. I how yeah, I see yeah. it. Yeah, and and yeah. to do and to do that with someone else's assets is the bit yeah. that gets really gross, you know. Yeah, and and it gives nothing back. You know, yeah. I I could understand the you know the cinemas complaining about Netflix or what was it called originally over here when you you would just join a club and they would post you three DVDs a month. Oh, love or, film, they were love great film, yeah. yeah. So uh, you know, I'm I quite... can understand the the the, uh, the cinemas getting upset about that, um, but this is this is different. You know, because Netflix eventually gave something back. They they actually produce produce content. Um, is it is it a bit different with the wonder stuff though like say say when the wonder stuff if the wonder stuff went to make another record like you would think maybe with your audience 
having more established record buying habits is it worth doing a record with the wonder stuff as opposed to no it's the same thing it's right. exactly the same thing right. uh, and here, here's the thing that surprises me like once i'd got my head around what spotify is and, and what it was doing culturally i thought okay so we're now going to have a generation of music listeners that actually think music is worthless um, you know, you know that whole thing about uh, the, somebody might open the back room of a pub and invite local bands to come and play for free. You know, bring you bring the audience. That means I'm selling beer. Uh, but, you know, uh, we can't pay you. It's good for the exposure. And, you know, you wouldn't say that to an electrician, you know, come around to my house and I'll tell everybody that you're really good, but I ain't, I ain't paying you. Yeah, yeah. Um, lost my train of thought with that. It was just it was just a good it was a good metaphor. Yeah. So I mean it's not mine it's that, that I've read that a bunch of times on social media but it is it is a good it, it, it it's just that it puts nothing back in I oh that's what I was going to say right. So I thought it, so we're going to have a generation of people now music listeners that think it's worthless. And um I accepted that. What I what I didn't and I, and I didn't really care because I'm, you know, I, I haven't picked up new, a new audience in 25 years, you know, a new generation of listeners. So I, I'm over all that. But what I didn't expect is it to happen to my generation of music listeners. And right. I, and yeah. judging by the sales of Wonderstuff Records, it, it has, you know, even 10 years ago. So we put out an album called, I think, Oh No. I think it was t about 12 years ago. And that's all great. We made the money back. And then we've done two, three, maybe since in that next 10 years where Spotify takes over, even though we don't put it on Spotify. And it is just doing it. Oh, I didn't know you had a new album. Mate. Is it on Spotify? I must have looked for it. No, I don't put new albums on Spotify. Right, I'm not right, giving right. my shit away after I've just spent two years working on something you know with with very talented people and paying yeah. them and getting that money together I, I ain't giving it away so yeah but there you go we should move on to something else i'm always moaning about shit like this well <laughs> i want to i want to it would be quite quite good to try and find a bit of resolution really because i think the thing is is that you know like I I sort of find myself it, it, this podcast is quite a weird thing for me. I feel almost feel like it's me having like a bit of an episodic, um, bit me having an episodic breakdown. If I'm being I honest, I think that's like, what all podcasts are actually. It is to a degree, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that especially when men do them, and I mm -hmm. I think I find that you know I I I was so lost to music as t as a teenager, and it kind of became my life and it became my job, and yeah, but and you know th that was littered with um you know as soon as anything becomes your job it, it just becomes more complicated but like ultimately the songs have always been the thing that sort of kept me around i'm always like yeah. i just i just can't find anything that i like <laughs> that, that anything that matters to me like music matters to me right okay yeah, yeah. um but i do look you know there's a lot of episodes of the podcast that are me speaking to my, my heroes really or kind of people who are grew up with really hanging on every word and they're all kind of like they don't really it's not like they're kind of wandering around camden wearing sandwich boards you know like sort of professing the um the end the end is nigh but there's i i definitely kind of find myself going well why are you doing this now like it just seems more trouble than it's worth did you, <laughs> did you, but and, but at the same time i'm in this place where i'm a bit like i just don't I, I can still hear, like I, I did the primitives the other day, and like I was like, I went down this rabbit hole of Crash covers, like the band, oh, yeah. bands that covered Crash. You know, did like, you find mine? Did you have you done Crash? I have, yeah. Oh, I'll go find that after this. What a treat! <laughs> um, but I, and it, you know, in those moments, I'm like, well, I can't do it. I just can't do anything else. I can't do anything else. Do you ever have you ever just thought about giving it all up? I did this year, totally, yeah, when, when I finished the album. Because then the other thing, so there's time, money, and then there's stress and anxiety involved right. in making records. And once again, like I always do when it comes to mixing a record, like making those final decisions on it, um, I'm at the doctor's and there's something the matter with me that I am convinced is going to kill me. And this has been going on for about 20 years. Every record I make, when it comes to mixing, I'm ill. All right, what, I make, what, my, I make me, myself ill. 
without me prying too much like what is it just this time it was uh i was convinced it was kidneys kidneys were wrong oh, okay and, and this is because some dear friends of mine have gone through a kidney episode that was very serious and thankfully he's now fine so there will be something in my head my nuts you know i've had these these are things that i haven't had but i've gone to the doctors with testicular yeah. cancer this year it was kidneys uh brain tumor i mean it just goes on and on and on and on and it's it's just stress and it went on for the three weeks and anxiety that we were mixing the record. And uh, I just got to the end of it, and I'm like, I ain't doing this again. I've got to st- I'm 56 years old this year. I ain't doing this anymore. This is ridiculous. So I went and got a job, and uh, it was just a part-time job, and I did it for seven months. And all of the way through it, I was like, why didn't I do this 20 years ago? I love it. I love doing something where I'm part of a little gang. I like doing something that is appreciated by the people that we serve and uh, absolutely loved it, loved every day of it. And um, and then I knew that I'd got to go out and do a bunch of acoustic gigs. And the job that I was doing involved like about four or 500 mile of driving a week. And I was like, I'm planning my gigs at weekends. And I'm like, I'm not driving all that distance in a week and then driving myself at the weekends. So I've taken leave of the job, but I, I'll, I'll go back next year. I, I've never been happier. That's, it's really weird, actually. It's really weird for me to be sat here and go, that sounds really inspiring. <laughs> um, can I be, um, can we, um, would you like to speak to Dr. McMahon? I've got some, I've got some thoughts. Happily. Well, I should, I should say that, I'm in a weird position as well where like I'm writing a book at the moment mm-hmm. and um my deadline is is inching ever closer and yeah. it's become a bit like I I mean I've enjoyed writing the book and I've needed to write the book you know it's, I mean I I've, ne- I've needed to write it because I took a load of money for it and I've spent it so that's mm-hmm. the main reason but I um it's also kind of felt a little bit like being in limbo as well because I I really crave that I, I really crave kind of everything that you've just said about employment and mm-hmm. in a weird way, I've just got to get this book finished and I can't, I can't kind of until this book, I, I, it's like I've signed up to something and I've got to see it through. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the book's about me and OCD. I have OCD. Okay. And super, I mean, like su- super like, um, misunderstood condition. But the first thing I was thinking when you were talking about that, almost like health anxiety. Yeah. The first thing I was thinking was OCD. Yeah. Um, you know, my stuff started with, like when I first started having like obsessive rumination about uh, ob- like obsessive intrusive thoughts and worries. Right. It was all health related. And, um, you know, I've had every part of my body scanned. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. And it's always been in times of great stress. Because yeah. I think stress is a real trigger for, um, for intrusive thoughts and that kind of that kind of rumination so absolutely i wonder whether do you know do you know rat from neds yeah very well yeah you i I saw that he was on the last record Mm -hmm. he um he has ocd and we did an episode where we got quite deep into the weeds with it yeah it might it might be worth looking into something like that you know i mean well all all my friends tell me that i have ocd i've i've never been that interested to it showed my, my my OCD shows its, itself in quite gentle ways. But I was talking to another dear friend that worked on the record, Luke Johnson, who's an amazing drummer, uh, multi instrumentalist, really. But he's the son of my first manager, Les Johnson. And they, they all live out in Arizona in the States now. But Luke and I have become really close just doing FaceTimes since really the lockdown started. We, we've always been close, but there's been five years where we don't see each other. But it's just as soon as you see each other, you start bouncing the ball again. And it's like, oh, man, we got to do this more often. And Luke's really looked into uh, mental health. And um, we have great conversations. In fact, it was only a month ago and, and we got into... You know, I was always known as a very difficult, angry dick to to work with. If you you know, whether I was doing interviews, whether I was on tour, the way I would deal with audiences, and um, it's all it's all anxiety related. 
yeah. it, it's all anxiety. It's funny. I, again, I was standing outside a little gig I was doing up in Robin Hood's Bay the other day, and the sucking on a cigarette outdoors in the rain before I go on. And and the promoter said to me, he "said Do you get nervous?" And I'm like, "No, I don't get nervous. I just want to get the job done. I just got, I just got to get the job done." And uh, I will really enjoy it. And I know there's nothing to worry about. I'm rehearsed. I know how to handle an audience. Uh, but right now, I hate this hour, like the, the hour before. Yeah. And that's when I can be narky and don't come near me and all that. But it's all to do with anxiety. And it, that's taken me, well, 36 years as a professional musician to figure that out, why I was difficult and why I didn't, why I almost went into situations making sure I didn't enjoy them, you know. Did, so so was, is this something that's followed you all the way through? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, um, do you feel, do you feel misunderstood? Um, no, because that puts it on other people. It's entirely my fault. Yeah, that is an interesting one, isn't it? Mm. I can sometimes find... You know, I've definitely had people over the years say that I was, you know, over opinionated or loud or, or <laughs> yeah. short or, um, and sometimes I've, I, sometimes I've found it difficult to hear because I've been like, you have no idea of the volume of noise in mm. my head and the sort of almost being locked, almost like, almost like not being able to get to someone almost like i mean i'm in here and i'm not these things but i just can't get there and um i sometimes can feel quite sorry for myself for that but uh, but it, that just compounds it because like you say it's it's not anyone else's problem yeah it's not it's not their fault that i can't make myself understood and I've i can got... jump i can jump to anger quite quickly you know not not physical but i can suddenly and it feels amazing um the last time there was a big breakup in the one stuff is only what four years ago maybe right and and in a huge incident with the band three of them were sacked on the spot but it was a thing that had been building for a long time in me and i hadn't been able to make myself understood i hadn't been able to help those three guys with the difficulties that they were having um yeah and it was their fault, but I could have made the situation a lot easier for everybody involved. Um, but where I, but I remember everything that came out of my mouth when I absolutely lost it was perfect. It, it took me to get to insane anger to the point where I didn't really even recognize the voice that was coming out of my body. That was really strange. I'm like, whose is this voice? I was thinking that, uh, but I was articulating everything perfectly, but it took to get to a really horrible spot. I um, One of the interesting things about doing this podcast is that when I speak to people like yourself, whose music I mattered to me so much as a teenager, it's mm. weird to be able to ask questions of things that maybe you would not think, oh, anyone would even think that, but... You know, it's almost like when I became a music journalist, I was like interviewing like contemporary bands, or sometimes I would do a cover story in a big band, and and that was a buzz. But really, I wanted to speak to the musicians I grew up with, right? So mm -hmm. th this podcast has been a real treat, like that. I guess that for me, like when the Wonder Stuff, um, when you called it a day the first time, mm -hmm. is this? I mean, I, I never, as a kid, you don't really think why. You just go, all oh, right, they're doing this big gig in at Phoenix Festival and it's they're calling it a day. And I never really understood why. Is this linked to what you're saying? Yeah, now I can see that, absolutely. It was me blowing my top, just basically going, I can't be around you people anymore. And again, it's it's me blaming them for something that I can't articulate or couldn't articulate at the time. Right. Um, but yeah, it's entirely based on that. My frustration was who I was with thinking, well, if I, if I could go and do something else, or if I could spend my days with other people that I don't yet know, um, designing this future for myself with a bunch of people that will magically be able to understand me. Um, 
yeah, that was what I got out of that because it made no fucking sense, did it, to to split up a band that was doing commercially very very well. And w- even when we told the record company, you know, we told them first, and and it was offered to us take a year off, take a year off, don't write any songs, don't make any demos, we'll pay for you for a year, we'll put you on like you know a retainer that's separate from the record deal. Just we we've done it um, as it the guy that was offering it to me. He said, we did it with Robert Smith. We did it with Weller. Uh, and yeah, you've you've pretty much been on a treadmill for about six years now. Take a year off. We don't want any, we don't want to hear from you. And I turned it down that it was just very kind and sensible and perhaps the right thing to have done. Um, but I turned it down because I said that I would know all through those 365 days that I've got to come back to this. So I wouldn't feel like I'd got away from anything. I have to, uh, you know, I, I put it in a lyric on the vent for one, four one four album. It's like, I would smash those building blocks just because I can. Um, it's weird that though as well. I mean, again, like I don't want to sort of play amateur diagnosis, but I do this <laughs> thing all the time, you know, like my, I, I basically had like two jobs in my life that were sort of quote unquote dream jobs, and like mm-hmm. both the both of them I've like I've left without right. without anywhere to go. Like basically, like I can't do this anymore. You know, like like after a decent period of time. But I think I've I've had similar things where you just go like if you just walk around the block or you just take in the weekend. Um, but I think there's something about control in there. Or where it's almost something like, well, almost that kind of thing of like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to almost like be in control of my own destiny, Mm -hmm. right? Like, and almost kind of, if I make a decision now, then I've got to stick to it. Mm -hmm. It's just, has kind of made me go, oh, that sounds a little bit familiar, Miles. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it is, it is, it's interesting you saying that though, about what the record company said to you and about how you almost feel about it now, because you know, you can say about bands that kind of go out at their peak. Um, I mean, it, it is bonkers. When you look at it, you're a little bit like n- knowing more about music now and not just being that kind of kid reading the music papers. It's like, mm-hmm. fucking hell, that was a bit mental, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It was a, it was a strange. And I did. That, and then I, I went off to MTV, you know, that was nothing I was looking for, but they offered me a job at MTV um, presenting. 120 minutes and alternative nation. I did that for nearly two years. Yeah. That was, I mean, the money was ridiculously good. <laughs> the, and the people that I work with every day were wonderful people whose company I really enjoyed. Yeah. And then of course I had to smash that up as well. You know, it, uh, although the, uh, that was a little bit different from the band. I, I I always thought I was capable of doing my advertised job in the band. I thought I could write songs, sing a bit, play guitar a bit. Whereas whereas the job at MTV, again, it was full of anger because I didn't think I was very good at staring into a camera. And I and I and I quickly learned I can't interview um, artists that I have no natural interest in. Yeah, yeah. I just can't retain the information. I, you know, I can read their bios. I can talk to friends of mine that know more about this artist. It just doesn't stay in. So, um, yeah, you know. It, so, so I had to get out of that. And and then and then it kind of worked all right that I started a new band with Pete Howard, who's now the Wonder Stuff drummer. And I knew Pete well. He'd been in Eat, and that, so we did Vent Four One Four and. And that was great, but then Morgan, the bass player who, you know, if you've got a band with Morgan in it and then Morgan decides to leave, you can't continue that band. Right. So special is his talent. Yeah. You can't replace him. So we had to knock that. We did try. We we, ne- we didn't re- release anything after Morgan left, but we did try to write more, but it was like, no, 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 actually Morgan was the fucking old sound of this band, wasn't he? So, um. But yeah, did you, like getting the job this year was just. It, did they know when you and you interviewed? Did they know who who you were and what you? Did? Oh yeah, yeah, they're local guys. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's um, a, a, a real ale brewery, so I fully nice. endorse the product. Yeah, and um, and I just saw on social media that they were advertising for drivers, so delivery drivers. So I just wandered into the brewery, and they kind of looked at me like, "What are you doing here?" 
Right. And I'm like, I've seen your advertising for drivers. What, what's the score? And then they're like, it's this, it pays this, this is what you'd be doing. All right, what do I do next? And they just said, turn up eight o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> I'm like, this is great. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, like I said, I did it for seven months. It, it was great. And it was, I, there, was a, there was lots of things, I suppose, of, I'll unwrap more of why I enjoy it as I go along. Um, but like, I felt I felt very very proud to work for them, and have I liked having bosses. I've never had a boss, so I hadn't had you know I had a job when I was nineteen. Yeah, I didn't I didn't care about keeping it or losing it because yeah. I always my I was like you were saying when you you just focused completely on music. Yeah. Whereas I'm not completely focused on music, so I you know the, my bosses are like thirty years old. <laughs> uh, I, I just thought it was great. Yeah, I really yeah. enjoyed it, and it's a tiny company, and I was proud to work for them, and I was proud to wear the shirt every day, delivering, and like you know, drive properly and represent the company, and it was great. It was really, really good, and it was physically, it got me fit. Um, I just feel a little bit like if you if they ever sort of had a go at you for being, I don't know, for not doing something right, I just think I, I would find it really hard not to just be like, hang about, I wrote the chorus the size of a car. <laughs> And that they had no diff I did plenty of things wrong. And then they were and of course I hate technology. Right. That's another lovely thing, a decision to make. I'm not making another record. I don't have to sit at this fucking computer day in, day out, gripping the mouse whilst trying to play, have a good idea and record it. Right. Uh, and then they at one point they were they were going, Okay, you have to start using this app now. And I'm like, what the fuck? Another app? I'm like <sighs> What's the what? Because the brewery is the oldest licensed brewery in the country. It's, it's uh, sixteen forty two. Right. It's the oldest license granted to a, a, yeah. a brewery, and I'm like, they didn't. Ha it didn't have apps like ten years ago. They didn't have apps, but for four hundred years, beer has been successfully delivered. I tried to put up a good argument, but then they're like, no, 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 no. This is the way it's done now. Download yeah. the app. Here's your password. Do it. And of Everything's they... very old in Shrewsbury, though, isn't it? Yeah. Am I saying Shrewsbury? So I'm saying Shrewsbury. I, you'll find that the locals say Shrewsbury. There's no R in it. Oh, right. Okay. It's never Shrewsbury. I don't know um, how that's happened. I went to watch my football team play uh, Shrewsbury, Shrewsbury, yeah. Shrewsbury. Sh just Shrewsbury. Um, I thought it was, uh, it was, it was, it was very nice. Is I, that I have the, a... the new ground. Yeah, well, it was five years ago, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that, is that Gay Meadow or is, is that the old ground? It's something Meadow, but I don't think they call it Gay Meadow now. Uh, Gay Meadow was the old one that was on the river where the guy would be in a rowboat on the That's River the, Seven. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's not, legendary. It's, 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 yeah, yeah it's, not, it's, it's not that one. I mean, yeah. it all went a bit weird. Didn't they change the badge to sort of like clip art lions and that called That's as of... much as I know about football. <laughs> there was a bloke <laughs> in a rowboat. Right. Okay. No, there was there was something to do. So the badge is like I think the badge tra traditionally was three lions, and right. um, they'd redesigned the badge at some point. And I think there was some hoo ha about the fact the lions seemed awfully awfully close to a design of a lion that was a, part of a clip art package. Okay. Um. So that was a that was a niche little fact I shared with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Um. Well, this stuff you were talking about, this sort of psychological assessment that we've done over the, mm -hmm. the last 40 minutes, mm. have you pinpointed where it comes from? As in, like, you know, with my stuff, I've with my stuff, I know exactly, you know. I would imagine for me it's um, it's because I was a painfully shy kid. Right. Painful. Like, there are so many photographs of me hiding behind my mom's skirt when I've been told to have my picture taken. So... Um, that's just me and he's still in there and um i just chose the wrong job you know i chose a job that said look at me look at me look at me when actually i hate being looked at man that's deep that it's such a fucking error that's so deep man because <laughs> it, it's funny because it's like you know when you watch old wonder stuff videos yeah if you so like if you if you weren't a fan of the band, you mm. could maybe be like, this guy, this guy's full of himself. 
And that's so no, weird. No, I, I, I've met plenty of people that have go. I, I didn't mind you, so, like, particularly people in America that are a lot freer with their opinions. <laughs> um, it's like, you know, I, I heard you on the radio and, and then I, I saw you live and saw your videos and I just hated you. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. I'm like, that kind of was the idea, though. So to invent this sort of bastard... Yeah, yeah. That yeah, the shy kid that can hide behind. Yeah, and then for a short period of time, maybe two years, I became the bastard. He right. he took over. The the right. invented guy took over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that that's when I had to get out of it in ninety four, or not? Yeah, ninety four. So, um, but yeah, now I know loads of people that like the, 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 the music's not bad, but I just couldn't stand you. Mm, that's fine. It's so weird, isn't it? It's like. I, this book I'm writing, I'm writing this bit at the moment about turning up at the NME when I was like 24, mm-hmm. and I was like, I was from the north, and there was not, there was not, there was not many people who. Well, it didn't you know, hurt James Brown. It didn't hurt James Brown, no. But I mean, you know, James Brown. I think I haven't read his book yet, but it's great. Yeah. Isn't it? Is it? It's really good. Oh God! If you're writing a book about yourself and you just dis- and the way you first describe yourself to me and a, and an instance, it's exactly the same as James going to London, going to the enemy, yeah. being northern. Yeah. Then th- perhaps to kick up the arse you need on your book, or to feel more confident or more secure in writing your book, is just read James's. It's fucking brilliant. Yeah, I mean, I do, I do relate a lot in the sense that I mean, you know, I kind of walked, I walked through the door and felt so. Like in just just insecure, really. Yeah. I just felt so, like I always have this thing about class, right? You know, people always, you know, sometimes people talk about classes about like money, and I don't think it is. I think it's about that feeling that you can, if you're raised middle class, for example, as opposed to being working class. I think you just you have a feeling that you're almost raised with a sense that you can do anything, mm-hmm. and I feel like with I I wasn't raised like that, and I right. think that how it came out was with us. I almost kind of created this like. I don't know, like almost like I, I was opinionated and I was loud and I would argue, I would almost be contrar- a bit of a contrarian sometimes, you know, yeah. just to get noticed. And yeah. then you'd go home and you'd be like, I fucking hate myself, you know. It's <laughs> like, uh, but I, yeah, no, it's, I, 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 I relate a lot to what you're saying, Miles. Mm, um, mm. And I really want, I, I really do want you to go to the doctors and say, oh, I was doing this podcast the other day and there's this bloke talking about OCD because I do think that that thing with that health stuff, it just sounds so familiar to my own experiences and other people I know in sort of OCD circles. Mm. But I always do go to the doctors with, with, the, with the new pain and I always sit down and say, okay, you're aware of my history. Because as soon as I've sat in the waiting room, whatever pain it is that I've gone there with has gone, because I'm now doing the right thing. You yeah, but I think I mean? that I think a good, I think a doctor that's clued up. I mean, I would at that point I would be going, all right, Miles, you come here like every year, like this can't be about the symptoms. This has got to be a larger problem. Yeah, but I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm too old. I mean, you're not though, are you? Like I mean, you're yeah. not like what you're mid fifties, fifty six. But no, I'm too I'm too old to to try and fix Milo. <laughs> oh, I no. uh, I don't yeah. I, I'm not having that. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. I've fixed loads of things. Like I cannot be in a relationship, and I cannot live with another human being. So that's fixed. That's good. That's good for everybody. But most of all, it's good for me. Right. Yeah. Sometimes it's good just to be realistic when you've learned things about yourself. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm happy with those choices, you know. And that's rat as well, you know. Rat rat lives on his own, not wishing to. You can edit that out if, it, if that's too much information on rat. But I got, you know, most of my friends. In fact, all of the friends that I really look forward to, you know, other than my local friends, it's easy to see. But uh, yeah, every one of my friends. Mm-hmm. Lives on their male and female live on their own, not in relationships. Completely sworn off relationships, and um, and we're we're a nice little gang. And and occasionally that gets talked about. Very occasionally. What do you mean? The the fact that we are all single, committed single, live on our own. There's about right. five of us, oh, and we're all right. of a very sim. We're all over fifty, right? And we all think that's a great thing. And why didn't we do this twenty years ago? interesting i mean i i met my wife 10 years ago and it was a bit of a 
a difference maker for me really like I, yeah. I i sort of felt the same really but but i definitely feel like there are things that you've said there where i'm a bit like there's definitely things i'm like yeah i've tried that a lot of times i think it just doesn't work for me and it's probably best to no and i'm not trying to instigate a problem between you and the dear lady um do you, want me, to, do you, do you want me to go <laughs> give us divorce papers that, that would be a weird way to end the interview no it's um but i have been a serial monogamist since i was 14 you know my right. first girlfriend and i were together for four years a mm. month off the next girlfriend four years the next uh, month off the next one five years yeah. month off the next one 11 years and it, it's just like why did i constantly pursue that lifestyle all brilliant people all wonderful people don't regret for a second meeting and loving those people uh one um but um <laughs> But yeah, it's took me this long to figure it out. So you, everything's changing. You're constantly in a state of flux, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but the last five years of being essential, and then add to which the the pandemic years, where I was on my own even more than I would plan to be on my own, I fucking loved it. That's really good to hear. I think that's. Um, I think that might be a nice juncture to exit stage okay. left um we should do this again i do this sometimes when people yeah, happily yeah yeah when people when, I, I was saying on, on the podcast the other day to someone that sometimes i do this thing when i'm trying to get out of when i'm almost trying to end an episode where mm -hmm. i'll be like hey we should do a part two of this and sometimes it's just me being like i don't really know how to end this conversation it's been right. great but i yeah, think yeah. that's that right but Sometimes I really mean it, and I mean it this time. Okay, um, well, you know, it's... also as well, because we haven't really touched upon this. Exactly. What, what, what I'm thinking, and, and I'm not trying to now squeeze in at the end, hey, guys, I've got a new album, Matt. That's not why I'm bringing well, that's, this up. Well, I but, was going to, before I departed, I was going to be like, do you want to just, like, say what you're up to? Because that would be No. What, what I'd like you to do is get a physical copy of the record, which would be a CD, and read the sleeve notes, because each song is about this. Ah. Each that's... song is my resignation letter i don't really like this resignation thing i'm still gonna gig because i actually do enjoy being on stage i i i i love being on stage with the band love it i love yeah. working with the band yeah it might just be because none of us get to do it as often as we would like but we love being with each other it's a great bunch of friends <clears throat> the stage experience is amazing now because nobody makes mistakes and even if it's a little one the recovery rate is incredible which hasn't always been the case in recent lineups right, right. um but and and i do enjoy my solo gigs being on stage um but if i write another song i'll just play it to myself um but yeah, that's what my whole album's about. It's called "Things Can Change." It's a it's a, it's a, a note to self, you know. It's a, things are constantly changing. Things will change. Things can change. And every song and every line of note before the lyric is about what we've been talking about. Amazing. Well, it's all works out for the for the best. Let's mm. do this. Let's do this again in um, on the other side of the the year, though. Because I yeah, think... I would really like to. Because I've got to say to you, this has been a, a thoroughly enjoyable chat. You know, I, you didn't ask me where did you get that crazy name, the Wonder Stuff from, and how did you guys meet? Yeah, I mean, that's not really <laughs> that's not really what I do. And I, I I know I know all those answers anyway. So. <laughs> no, uh, but listen, definitely. Miles, have a lovely Christmas, and mm. um, I'll check in with you in the new year. That'd be nice, man. Take care, man. All right. <laughs>